In the Bible, God says that he's the I am, the God who gives you dreams and speaks to you in night seasons. In Job 33, 14 to 18, he says this, For God may speak in one way or in another, yet man does not perceive it. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls upon men, while slumbering on their beds, he opens the ears of men and seals his instruction in order to turn man from his deed and conceal pride from man. He keeps back his soul from the pit and his life from perishing by the sword. Now in this passage, it says that he opens the ears of men. It's actually men and women. And you'll hear in the stories that I tell later exactly how that happens. Daniel 7, 1 says this, Earlier during the first year of King Belshazzar reign in Babylon, Daniel had a dream and he saw visions as he lay on his bed and he wrote the dream down and this is what he saw. Now Daniel also happened to be an interpreter of dreams. Then in Matthew 2, 13, after the wise men were gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, get up, flee to Egypt with the child and his mother. Stay there until I tell you to return because Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So Joseph was giving a warning in a dream. And then in Genesis 48, it says, we both had dreams, but there was no one to interpret them. And these are two characters called the butler and the baker who are in prison with Joseph. And Joseph says to them, do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me your dreams. What he's communicating in this is that dreams have interpretations and God alone is the one who can give them. And then in Joel 2, 28, it says, then after doing all those things, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams and your young men will see visions. So again, as I have shared in other programs, God just doesn't say that he is these things, he proves it. So in Genesis 41, Pharaoh has some dreams and he has these dreams of cows and dreams of grains and these are his dreams. In his dream, he saw seven fat, healthy cows come out of the river and began grazing in the marsh grass. And then he saw seven more cows come up from behind the Nile, but these were scrawny and thin. These cows stood by the fat cows on the river bank and the scrawny thin cows ate the seven healthy fat cows. At this point in the dream, Pharaoh woke up, but he fell asleep again and he had a second dream. And this time he saw seven heads of grain, plump and beautiful growing on a single stalk. And then seven more heads of grain appeared, but these were shriveled and withered by the east wind. And these thin heads swallowed up the seven plump, well-formed heads. Pharaoh woke up and realized it was a dream. Now these dreams were really powerful and they disturbed Pharaoh, it says in the scriptures. And so he went to all the magicians and all the wise men trying to get them to interpret them and none of them could. But a while before, his butler had actually been in prison with Joseph, who was an interpreter of dreams. And so the butler says to the king or to Pharaoh, listen, you imprisoned us a while ago. I had this dream, the baker had the dream. Joseph was able to interpret it and everything happened exactly as he said. And so because of this testimony, Pharaoh then went and got Joseph out of prison to come and interpret his dream. So he tells Joseph these dreams and Joseph has the meaning because he seeks God for them. And this is what he says. Both of Pharaoh's dreams mean the same thing. God is telling Pharaoh in advance what he is about to do. The seven healthy cows and the seven healthy heads of grain both represent seven years of prosperity. The seven thin scrawny cows that came up later and the seven thin heads of grain withered by the east wind represent seven years of famine. This will happen just as I have described it for God has revealed to Pharaoh in advance what he is about to do. And so he starts telling Pharaoh that there's gonna be this prosperity, that there's gonna be famine, but he doesn't just tell him that this is gonna happen. He also says that it's gonna be so severe that the good years will be erased in the famine. And then God fills Joseph with wisdom to be able to say this, therefore, Pharaoh should find an intelligent and wise man and put in him charge of the entire land of Egypt. And he goes on to give such good advice to Pharaoh that Pharaoh decides he's gonna put Joseph in this position to rule over the land of Egypt. Through this powerful dream, 
and, this, and the interpretation from the scriptures, we see that God cares for everyone. He doesn't just care about people who follow him. Pharaoh was a follower of false gods, yet God was willing to give him a dream to warn him about the coming famine so that he could be prepared. And God used Joseph to speak the interpretation. God uses dreams to speak to believers and non-believers alike in order to keep them from perishing. We need only listen. I want to share with you some stories from everyday life where God has spoken into the lives of men and women to prepare them for what is going on. I want to start with one of my stories. Back in 2012, I was asked to help lead an outreach at the London Olympics along with my husband. And as I've shared in other episodes, this is something that we do often. And you know, we're, there are standard things that we do generally when we go on these outreaches. We pray for people, we ask God to move in healing, we interpret dreams, we ask God what he's speaking and we prophesy over people. And we've said, seen many, many people touched and turned to Jesus. But I knew for this outreach that there was something in particular that God had that we had not done before. So I prayed and I asked God to lead me. And in a dream experience, it was something that happened at night. It wasn't a metaphorical dream the way you have most dreams, but God just started speaking to me. And he told me that art was going to be very important for this outreach. We had never incorporated art into our outreaches before. So as I woke up, I prayed into this, and what I felt to encourage the church that we were working with to do was to go gather together a group of people and seek the Holy Spirit for what to paint and to ask the Holy Spirit what he might want to speak through those paintings to people, and they did just that. At our first outreach, we put these canvases out for people to look at, and when they came into our booth, we just said, is there anyone that particularly touches your heart? And as they would share with us what touched their heart, we would then speak to them about what the painting was revealing about the nature of God and it may be about their lives too. So there was a young girl who came in and there was a flag of the United States and it said freedom over the flag. And I knew that that is what exactly what this girl was looking for. And so as she looked at it, I just encouraged her. I said, my sense is that you really care that people are able to really be themselves, to really be free in who they are. And you're free in who you are. And you're someone who loves it when your friends are and you encourage them to be so. Then she told me that her name was Eden. And as she told me her name was Eden, I said, gosh, do you know what your name means? And she didn't. So I talked to her about the Garden of Eden. And I talked to her about how in the Garden of Eden, it was a picture of how we were to be able to interact with our Creator so freely and so beautifully and to be free. And as I started sharing this with this little girl, she was so excited. She had two pigtails and she just started pulling on her pigtails and she started getting rocking back and forth and she started laughing and pretty soon she started jumping, just filled with joy. And um, it was beautiful to see. So in this dream that God gave me, he was sharing with me about reaching a community in a different way than I'd ever thought. And I could tell you countless testimonies that came from that outreach, just like this little girl who were touched by the Spirit of God as we ministered to them through the art. It is amazing how God can re what God reveals to us through dreams that help to prepare us exactly for the circumstances ahead. This next story comes from a woman named Dee Dee. She was in her late 20s at the time, and she was at a crossroads in her life. You see, her husband had just left his faith in Jesus, and she was really angry with Jesus as to why he did not reveal himself to her husband more. And so she had a dream. And in this dream, Jesus was standing at the crossroads. Her, she says this, my husband had decided to take a path away from them, him. I stood there arguing with Jesus about why my husband was taking that path. And in anger, I started down after my husband, but then realized what I was doing, and I came running back to Jesus and fell at his feet. So in this dream, Jesus was letting Didi know that she was at a crossroads and that he wanted her to recommit her life to following him. And she has. And many years later, her husband is still not yet walking with Jesus, but she's praying in faith for when it will happen. This is a story from a friend of mine who's in her 30s. Her name is Kim. 
This is another significant dream, the way that God intersects the spirit with ours, with our lives. I went to a conference once where the head speaker told a story about how he woke up in the middle of the night with his bed shaking, and he heard the voice of the Lord saying, along with the shaking, I want to spend time with you. It was tender and beautiful and exciting to me, and I was curious. Wow, that's crazy, I thought. The God of the universe would do that? He would cause a bed to shake and would speak like that to someone because he just wanted time with him? It blew my mind. Now, I had experienced some things like this as a kid, so it wasn't completely foreign to me, but I had tucked it away for so long, I had forgotten what this looks like, and something in my spirit was rekindled, and I was excited. I didn't know it then, but I was in the process of being forever changed. As I was processing all that came from the conference in the coming days, the story of the bed shaking and Jesus speaking to the speaker like that really stuck with me. As it would be, I woke up in the middle of the night, and no, not to the bed shaking, but I sensed Jesus saying the same thing to me. I want to spend time with you. And I wanted to spend time with him. So for six months, Jesus woke me up every single night, with the exception of Christmas morning. And I worshiped him. And I listened to sermons. And I read the Bible. I was hungry. I just wanted to be with him. And it was amazing. The amount of supernatural things that would happen in this time was too precious for words, and it was so sacred. I am still in awe of him today because of the work he did in me. Well, during this time, I was introduced to a man of God named John Paul Jackson. He had gone to be with the Lord by the time I learned of him, but I was really investing time in his teachings, his sermons, his books. If there was a sermon on YouTube, I probably listened to it, even a couple of times. He was teaching me things that I had absolutely no idea about, and I was excited to be learning from him. He had so much reverence for God, and he made everything all about Jesus, and he made a walk with God seem so exciting and deep and wonderful. Since I'd never really knew about an exciting or supernatural walk with Jesus before, well, technically I knew, I just tucked it away, I was a little curious and maybe even a little skeptical. And I questioned God about John Paul to make sure I wasn't being led astray. I wanted only what was of God. I wanted to know that John Paul really was of God. And then I had a dream. And in this dream, I was in the old gymnasium of my old college, one that wasn't used too much anymore. I was seated at a student's desk in the middle of the room and the room was completely white and super bright. The only people in the room were God, John Paul Jackson, and me. And the only thing I heard in the dream was God say that John Paul Jackson is legitimate. Wow, what an amazing gift from God to help assure me that what I was pursuing was not only good, but that he approved. It meant so much to me for him to do that for me. And I was so thankful for this dream to confirm what was so preciously on my heart. He really does speak in dreams and during the night. I love him so much. God cares so much about us that he knows that Kim was studying John Paul's materials and he wanted her to know that John Paul was indeed legitimate and worth studying. And he gave her this revelation through a dream. So we see in these stories that Jesus is a God who gives us dreams, who speaks to us in night seasons. Not every dream is from him, only ones that point to him in his ways, but he is a dream, dream giver for sure. So we see in this way that the Lord warned Pharaoh about the famine in speaking to him about, um, in speaking to me about how to prepare with art for an outreach, in inviting Dee Dee to recommit her life to him, and inviting Kim to spend time with him and letting her know that she was on the right track. Jesus is the one who gives us dreams and he speaks to us in night seasons. In the Bible, it also says that the I am is God's son, sent to be seen face to face. That's Jesus. In the scriptures in Exodus 33, 11, it says, so the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. And in John 1, 1 to 14, it says this, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God 
and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. This is speaking of Jesus. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, not even one thing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was a light of mankind, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not grasp it. A man came, one sent from God, his name was John. He came as a witness to testify about that light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. That, this was the true light coming into the world that enlightens every person. He came to his own, and his own people did not accept him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of a man, but of God. And in Revelation 22, verse 4, it says, Upon the return of Jesus, that we will see his face, and his name will be written on our foreheads. Now we see this, that Jesus is seen in the scriptures this way, face to face. And Luke 2, we're presented with the story of a man named Simeon. He had been promised by the Holy Spirit that he would not die until he had seen Messiah. And so, on the eighth day, when Jesus was taken to the temple to be dedicated, Simeon was there. He'd been waiting for the Messiah. And upon seeing Jesus, he recognized as a baby that Jesus was Messiah. He was led by the Spirit to the temple that day. And when he took the child in his arms, he said this, Sovereign Lord, now let your servant die in peace as you have promised. I have seen your salvation, which you have prepared for all people. He is a light to reveal God to the nations, and he is the glory of your people Israel. You see, the Holy Spirit had promised Simeon that he would not die until he had met the Messiah. Jesus, the Son of God, was sent by God the Father to be seen face to face and to reveal who Father God is, not just to Simeon, but to all of us. When we see Jesus, we see the Father, the one who is God. Now I want to share with you a testimony of an everyday ordinary person. This woman was the very first woman in her family, person in her family, to come to know Jesus. And of course she prayed for all of her other family to come to know Jesus. And over the years she had seen them come. But her father did not yet know him. And just a couple years ago when she was home visiting, she was pleading with the Lord to reveal himself to her father. And her father was very angry that the rest of his family was following Jesus. He didn't understand it. But one day he was in his room and Jesus appeared in physical form in his bedroom. And in this, his bedroom was a photograph of a false prophet. And Jesus pointed to the photo and he said, He's dead. I'm alive. Follow me. And immediately, the man became a believer in Jesus. And now the whole family is saved. Jesus showed up face to face because he knew that this is what the man needed in order to follow him. How amazing is that? That he showed up in the flesh face to face to reveal who he is. Now I want to share another testimony. This man's name is Beckett and he's in his 40s. He was raised in the Catholic family, but he was not a follower of Jesus for many years of his life. This is his story in his own words. From a young age, I experienced same-sex attraction and I didn't know where it came from. It was a surprise to me. I knew according to my family and the Catholic Church and the culture around me that it was wrong. So I just internalized what I was feeling and I didn't talk about it. In high school, I became best friends with a gay guy though, and we came out to each other and I was able to express my feelings and we started to explore gay culture together. I was 15 years old and I was going to gay clubs and bars. How we got in, I will never know. I went to college and became best friends with another gay guy. I decided not to come out in college 
I wasn't yet prepared to identify as a gay man. But after college, I went to Tokyo and I met someone from America who would become my first boyfriend. And that was when I began to identify as a gay man and I came out to my friends and my family. I eventually moved to Los Angeles. I became friends with a group of people who were all ambitious and they were talented people, all in Hollywood in terms of writing, directing, acting, producing. We were best, best friends. Some of them became famous, some of them now run Hollywood. During that time in my 20s in LA, I was having the time of my life. I was going to parties, I was meeting everyone, I was going to movie premieres and award shows and all of the parties with really famous people. I loved my life. I thought it was what life was all about and having these experiences and having these relationships and finding love, that's what we all pursued. Being successful in our careers, being successful in relationships, achieving something, really making our mark on this world and finding true love. That's what we thought it was about. But as the years went by, the law of diminishing returns set in and I started to feel less and less satisfied. I had this moment in Paris at Paris Fashion Week in March 2009 and I was at a party and everyone in the fashion world was there and everyone's dancing and having a great time and I was sitting at a table and I just thought to myself, is this all there is? And I thought, what am I gonna do with the rest of my life? I can't keep doing this, going to parties, it's, it's not satisfying, it's not fulfilling anymore. But I, I knew Jesus was never an option because I was gay. That was off the table. So I thought, what am I going to do? What's the meaning of life? Where do I come from? Why am I here? Where am I going? That question was always in me. But it came to a head that night in Paris. Well, six months later, I'm at a coffee shop in LA and I'm with my best friend and I see a group of people and they all have their Bibles out on the table and I had never seen a Bible in Los Angeles in public. I was shocked. But we ended up getting into a conversation with them and I asked them what they believed and they shared the gospel with me. And then I got to this question. So of course I wanted to know what, is, what do they believe about homosexuality? And they answered, we believe it's a sin. And I was kind of surprised at their frankness, but I appreciated their honesty. Um, it was actually amazing that I didn't just walk away. A, a few months before I would have for sure, but something in me just thought, what do I know? Maybe I'm wrong about everything. I, I could be wrong. Well, they ended up inviting me to church, and for some reason, I ended up going the next Sunday. The pastor spoke on Romans chapter 7 for about an hour, and I remember thinking and being just amazed and gripped by what he was saying. And I remember thinking, I, I don't exactly understand what he's saying, but I know that it's true. He finished the sermon, and he invited people up to receive some prayer afterwards. And I thought to myself, do I go over there? Do I, do I get prayer? Because if I do that, I'm admitting to myself that maybe this could be real. So I would take a step and I would go, but then I would hesitate. And finally, I just thought, I'm, I'm here. I'm, I might as well just go do this. I went up to this guy and I said, listen, I don't know what I believe, but I'm here. And he prayed with me and it was really powerful. And I remember being shocked by how intense it was. I'd never heard a prayer like that before. And afterward, I thanked him. I went back to my seat and I was there for a, a few minutes and I was kind of numb and processing what uh, was going on. And then all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit just came like, Whoa! And he just overwhelmed me. And it was like Paul on the road to Damascus. It was just like, bam! God revealed himself to me in that moment and I came undone. And he said this, I'm God, Jesus is my son. The Bible is true, heaven is real, hell is real. You're reconciled to me now, you are now in my kingdom. I've adopted you and you're my child. And I completely fell apart. And I was like, oh my gosh, I just started bawling and bawling and bawling. It was like joy and sorrow all mixed together. I was crying over meeting the God, the king of the universe, but I was also crying over my sin. It was like Isaiah in the temple when he sees God's holiness and he just comes undone. And I cried and I cried. I've never cried harder in my life. I was uncontrollable for like 25 minutes. Then I got home and the same thing happened again. I was in bed. And it was like Moses in the cleft of the rock and God just like came whoa, with his glory all over again. And I was overwhelmed. I jumped out of bed and I just said, God, you have my life. You have everything. I'm done. You have everything. And I knew in that moment that I was done with being homosexual. I knew that it wasn't who I was anymore. 
praise God. This is one of the ways that God meets us face to face. Having encounters like this, when he reveals who he is and his nature. Now, not everyone comes to know Jesus this way, but some do. And God in his sovereignty knows exactly how to reveal himself to us when we are searching. We see in these stories that Jesus is the God who was sent to be seen face to face. The Lord was faithful to fill his promise to Simeon that he would meet Jesus before he died, that he would meet the Messiah in Jesus before he died. And they came in the flesh to that man who was following a false prophet, and he came in the flesh and revealed himself to him. And he met with Bickett face to face in an incredible encounter, and he revealed his glory. Jesus is a God sent to be seen face to face. So I bless you. I bless you to know this God who gives you dreams and who speaks to you in night seasons. I ask that God would open up the night season for you and reveal who he is and answer the questions that you have on your heart about him and also prepare you for things that are happening in life. This is how he leads us. And I bless you to know God's son, Jesus. He was sent to be seen face to face. May you see him. May you know him. May you choose to follow him. God bless you. I went over on that one. <laughs>